Thank you, Leslie, for those kind words. I um, am excited to be here. It's a lovely, beautiful day in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'm um, particularly excited to give this because this is actually one of my most favorite topics in, um, in, the, uh, in the speaking that I do. So um, I'm looking at a map of the United States as I sit in a private room. We work in an open, open office environment at the Arbor Day Foundation. So I booked a private room and I always book the one with the map in it of the U.S. so I can see uh, where people are and where where I'm where I'm talking and it's um, it's kind of fun that way and knowing that urban community forestry across the country meets with some of the same challenges and some of the same opportunities we know that we are not alone in this whole thing so that's kind of where I'm going to start is to talk about um, where we are with what we would call partnerships or um, volunteers sometimes but if um, we were in a room together, I would ask you the question, how many of you have a fully funded, perfect urban and community forestry program where you live and work? And since I'm in this room and I can't see you, I bet that none of you are raising your hands right now because if we were in a room together, none of you would be. And the good thing to know is that you are not alone and that everybody needs more. And they need more through funding, they need more opportunity, they need more trees, they need more collaboration, everybody needs more. Um, and that amount of more varies on whatever subject you're, you're, you're uh, interested in. A few years ago, and actually it started in 2015, uh, there was a research project that was completed by Dr. Rich Hauer and Ward Peterson of the Davy Tree Expert Company, and it was called the Municipal. It was called Municipal Tree Care and Management in the United States. And many of you may have heard about this um, research that was done. Some of you may have participated in the survey that took uh, days. Some people told us. And uh, anyway, it had some really great results and some great ideas that came out of it. And I'm going to start my talk with that today because there was an article that was published called Financing the Urban Forest, Volunteers as a Source of Revenue and Program Support. This, um, this article really talked about the fact that urban foresters have a huge list of tasks to do. And cities, when, when I say urban foresters, community foresters, cities who are managing uh, urban forests, they all have a huge list of tasks to do. And many went to college for those tasks. There are many foresters that, of course, majored in forestry. Um, I am an urban forester who majored in political science, which I sometimes think is a better uh, use of a degree uh, than sometimes forestry. Uh, but um, anyway, I think that what they're talking about here is that these tasks many times do require what we consider professionals. Uh, uh, foresters, urban foresters, uh, plant health care technicians, etc. Certainly, and this is a direct quote from the article, that certainly mature tree management, including pruning, removal, and diagnosing and treating ailments, are, um, are linked into those, those kinds of professional outreach. But it could be argued that mulching, watering, planting trees other than large, large trees, um, data entry, some levels of pruning and monitoring are less demanding of experience, education, and stamina. And that's what we'll focus on here. And that maybe it's time that we really consider volunteers or partnerships as an in these engaged community citizens as alternative sources of revenue. Now the average urban forester makes about $47,000 a year. It's a good salary, it's respectable, some feel it's woefully low, um, but I think that we can enhance all those tasks that have to be done by a person who makes $47,000 a year by adding support. So when we talk about what kind of things that partners can do, the number, the number um, top four things that people answered in this survey were this. 
planting, watering, pruning, and outreach. Of course, I'll talk a little bit about planting first. I manage the Alliance for Community Trees program, as Leslie told you. Last year alone, we, we sponsored and helped with um, and gave funding through our partners to, for 79 tree plantings last year, fiscal year that just ended, 79 tree plantings across the country. So those were all done by volunteers, most of the time with the help of professionals, and they were done a certain way. And we ask at the Arbor Day Foundation, we ask that they follow best management practices of the International Society of Arbor Culture. Many cities actually um, use a different set of standards, but we ask them to follow the standards of the ISA, or we ask them to follow the standards in which the city in which they work. So nonprofit volunteers planted, um, I think we, we determined they planted about 10,000 trees last year in those projects that we funded. Other projects that we fund have to do with watering and pruning. And when I say watering, um, this just means tree care opportunity to, uh, to either uh, water through, uh, not through an, an existing infrastructure system that might be already in place with trees, but rather to do things like use bicycles to put a tank on the back of, or um, actually nonprofits have bought trucks that they use in their community and they have a licensed driver to, uh, to do that. Um, in Indianapolis, many of you may have seen the, the tree care group in Indianapolis, Keep Indianapolis Beautiful. They actually have a watering cart, a watering trailer that they put together to water all the trees that they put in, um, and also other trees that the city asks them to water. And then we do young tree maintenance. Here in Lincoln, Nebraska, we actually have a new program that we're working on with the, um, with the city where our professional here, a gentleman by the name of Pete Smith, he'll go out and he'll teach people how to prune trees, and young trees that have been put in. We're replacing ash trees here at a rapid rate, and I believe that this is a good program that has really helped um, the urban forester here with the maintenance that he has, um, has had to complete with young trees. And then there's outreach. And outreach is the one where you can really rely on people who have a different um, set of skills. And we talk about who can who can do this. Who are these people in your in your partnerships? Who are these people who could support what you do? Well, first we always want to talk about allied professionals. When I ran my tree organization in California, I had a certified arborist on my board of directors. I felt that that was really important. But I also partnered with the Utility Arborist Association members, people under, who are um, utility foresters, and talk to them about what trees to plant below the power lines or near power lines. I worked with the Society of Municipal Arborists. I worked with landscape architects. I worked with water professionals. And, and the list goes on and on in the allied professions. We have found now that there are people who are working with hospitals and that there are people who are working with psychologists, doctors, et cetera, to help them build their program. And then we talk about schools. So, of course, everybody loves to work, um, everybody loves to plant trees. So schools especially like to plant trees on their own property, but schools also have some other opportunities with uh, with young people who need to get they need to get some sort of credit so you can work with things like interact which is rotary or key club which is kiwanis those are young people in those clubs at schools and local other groups such as the ffa which no longer goes by future farmers of america but they do do a lot of outdoor type work and then there's environmental clubs and things like that and of course your universities and your community colleges in your town also can create great partnerships as well. Um, sustainability programs at universities are coming out more and more. In fact, I just noticed um, I follow Pac-12. Um, that might give you a hint is where my first favorite football team comes from. But um, I follow the Pac-12 and they had a sustainability conference of Pac-12 schools and they were looking at how um, tree planting is an important part of that. And then you can reach out to the community and within the community, of course, you have service clubs. And if you could raise your hands again, I bet a number of you were contacted by Rotarians this past year as their president asked that every Rotarian around the world plant a tree. 
Our phones rang off the hook. We did a planting in Omaha with a group of Rotarians. Um, among other people, we spoke to a number of Rotary clubs around here, and I bet you you did as well. Um, there's environmental clubs. The Sierra Club in California was a uh, really great opportunity to work with. That We had great partnerships with them, wrote grants together, and actually worked with them to enhance the tree canopy in the city in which, we, in which I lived. Um, conservation corps, they run across the country. Sometimes uh, they, they take different formats. And, and sometimes the youth facilities that go along, sometimes with conservation corps, might be another great place to work. Moving beyond that a little bit, you can talk a bit more about the outreach activities that you might want to develop some partnerships with. And advocacy and policy support are people who are, are your people who love trees and need want to help, but really, you know, getting out on a Saturday and planting a tree is not necessarily who they want to uh, or what they want to do, or even physically can do. So we talk a little bit about advocacy support and people that go to city council and say, you know, we need more funding for this. And uh, that would also be nonprofits can do that for those that work in cities. They can do that sometimes more easily than you can if you work in a city and if you're managing a tree program. And then policy support. Um, I, when I worked in uh, Bakersfield, we wanted a parking lot shade tree ordinance, and so we put a coalition of people together and built a partnership for that and determined, did the research, where else this was going and where it was going well, and um, got people together and actually advocated for that and got that passed so that there is a parking lot shade ordinance there now. And that's basically how many um, of those kind of policies start with citizen partnerships. But the desire of the urban forester in our city was that we had that shade, we had that parking lot shade ordinance, and he actually gave us the hint that this is something that we might want to do. So policy support sometimes comes through a municipality, not openly, but definitely um, with opportunity attached. And of course, activities, you know, tree board activities, which is part of policy in many cities. Um, as I look at the map across the country. I know after look, working in the um, middle of the country now and working on to both coasts that, uh, that tree boards are actually more prevalent in the east than they are in the west. And I could probably name the number of tree boards on one hand in the state of California, maybe on two hands. They just are not a lot of them. And so tree boards are uh, an important part of partnering and they are um, reflective of communities, so they're very important. Fundraising is another way. Uh, fundraising can be done through a nonprofit, not necessarily the one that uh, is the tree nonprofit, but maybe there's another nonprofit organization in your community that raise funds for doing good and you can be a part of what they do. I was thinking about grants that I used to get from the Junior League and the Junior League used to hold a tree a tree um, event every year because they wanted to support the organization that I worked for. So those kind of outreach committees and partnerships are important. So who can you reach out to to help you develop some sort of fundraising mechanism to enhance your program? And then of course there's grant, um, grant writing and grant matching. And those are very important things because you want to increase your funding I have asterisks by the two things, tree boards and fundraising, which also help go towards your Tree City USA requirements. And you want to be sure that you're calculating the hours of all of these people that help you as well, because that will help with the grant match. I'm going to go into some stories of some partnerships here so that you can see some of the things that were put, have been put together over the last few years. This story, uh, the Santa Rosa Tubbs fire story is amazing. And, and what happened here was, was um, a true testament to what I think are some really strong partnerships. Up in the corner, we have a gentleman in the plaid shirt who's teaching how to plant a tree. And he's with uh, Cal Fire. He's an urban forester, uh, regional urban forester with Cal Fire. In the middle, we have people who um, lived in this area. Um, this area is where the Tubbs fire blew through in October of 2017. 
And then up on the right, we have a family who lived in that area as well. And you'll notice a lot of green t-shirts. So here's the partners on this. The funding came from Comcast. The Comcast funding came to the Arbor Day Foundation, and they said that they wanted to do a project that impacted um, and helped to recover from the fires in, um, in Santa Rosa area in California. So immediately, uh, we reached out to the city forester, and she was not ready, actually, to plant trees. Um, no fault of her own. They were still assessing their damage. They were still trying to figure out what how FEMA was going to play into this role. So then we reached out to the California Urban Forest Council, and they said, well, we'd love to uh, help with the tree planting, but we really don't know anybody in the area either. So I reached out to the gentleman in the corner, his name is Jimmy Scheid, and he is the uh, Cal Fire Urban Forester, and said, you know, what's going on? How can we help? And he said, well, he was working with a homeowners association that managed an open space where there was once all houses. There were only two houses left standing. Because they were a private entity managing this open space, we were able to um, get the funding to them. The people that participated in this were amazing. So we had people from actually from Comcast who lived in the area. We had Cal Fire. We had the California Urban Forest Council. We had a Rotary Club that came down from Sacramento, and that's about an hour and a half drive that came to help. We had the Neighborhood Association. We had a private nursery and Bartlett Tree. So I just counted those, and there were seven partners that put this on. It was an amazing day, and it actually jump-started all the, um, the fire, began to jump-start fire restoration projects with trees. So those, that's a really good example of a very diverse partnership, and sometimes it takes that many people to get things together. Friends of Trees is a nonprofit organization in Portland, Oregon, and Eugene, Oregon. And Eugene is near and dear to my heart because that's where I went to college. So now you probably know what my favorite football team is. And Friends of Trees does some amazing work. Now, the city of Portland has an outstanding urban forestry program, and so does the city of Eugene. But as most um, municipal programs, their funding has uh, been up and down. And so Friends of Trees sat down with both cities and said, how can, we, how can we help, as opposed to how can we interject ourselves? How can we help? And one of the things that the city of Portland decided was that they really wanted to do a tree inventory. And they felt that they were not ready for an inventory that would cost them a lot of money. They had some funding for it, but not a lot. So Portland worked with the city and began to rally uh, neighborhoods, and they did a tree inventory by neighborhoods. Now, when a nonprofit and does a, a does an inventory, or when citizens do an inventory, they're really not necessarily looking for um, tree defects or things like that. They're actually just looking at species and location. And so, many cities have done this across the country, and it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of work on the part of the um, entity that's developing this. And it takes a lot of oversight. And so the city was willing to, to pay them to get some of that work done. And in Eugene, it's become somewhat of the same thing. So Friends of, Friends of Trees is started in Portland, and they've really moved down that Willamette Valley to south to Eugene, and have really been working in that corridor. They work in Salem as well and around uh, around Portland, and they do all kinds of work. So they're advocates, and they're um, and they're doing tree inventories, and most importantly, what people love to be involved is is tree planting. And at some point, many cities across the country have turned over their tree planting completely to nonprofits. I don't think they're quite there yet at Friends of Trees, but they're getting rather close. But um, Houston sends a lot of their tree planting to Friends of Trees. And I know that in Los Angeles, a lot of the tree planting is done by uh, City Plants, which is an overarching organization over other nonprofits that helps other nonprofits distribute, pro distribute projects throughout the LA Basin. So we are um, we're seeing this more and more and more. 
but it has to be done right and it has to be done with oversight. But they're doing a great job up there in Portland. And speaking of taking over the tree planting, Open Lands in Chicago really does almost all of it now. And Open Lands is um, part of, they do tree planting, but they do other things as well. They are, um, they're a conservation organization that works in Chicago. They have huge partnerships with the Morton Arboretum, and they work on a project called the Community, um, the Community Tree Restoration Initiative. And in that initiative, they're working to teach people to not only plant trees, but to what to look for in caring for trees. This particular project that this picture is from, we planted 11 trees, giant ball and burlap trees in Chicago to take the place of some trees that we removed because of emerald ash borer. But additionally in this project, uh, there were some small fruit trees planted as well as garden beds put in in this particular neighborhood. The partnership there was with the city, of course, but also with the Neighborhood Association and the, most importantly, the, um, the Alderman's Office, who actually funded a good portion of this project in addition to private funding. So involving lots of parties, like the seven parties that I mentioned for Santa Rosa, these, this is normal for, for Open Lands to involve a lot of parties in this. They pull their funding from a lot of different places, and so we had private and public partnerships here. And I drove by this about a year ago, the location that we worked at, and it was amazing what had, what had happened with this project. First off, the trees are huge, and, um, but second, this, this food growth, this food is growing in this, on this corner um, in the inner city, and it's cleaned up. The area has been really cleaned up by the fact that people are paying attention to this one particular city block that we happen to work in. So bringing in a city council office, there was also a, um, a, a community garden organization, there was Open Lands, there was Boise Paper, there was Office Depot, and then there was um, the Arbor Day Foundation in this particular project as well. In Palo Alto, California, there's a nonprofit group there called Canopy. And Palo Alto has a really uh, great urban forestry program. They're, um, I would say, pretty close to having a, you know, their goals in canopy cover, but they still have to manage all of the trees. And the project that, that project partnership here is really unique in that um, their city has their first urban forester, they have a planning forester that they work with, and then they have this, this group from Canopy. And what Canopy does is obviously, from this picture, they plant a lot of trees. But in order to maintain those trees, they have to go into their software system that the city manages. So they actually go out with a different software system, and they go out and look at every tree they've planted within the last five years and they train the volunteers what to look for and then they document actually what they're doing in the software so if they come upon a tree in which they planted that still has a stake attached and it needs to be removed they remove that stake and they mark that they have removed that stake they may look at a tree and say this needs you know tree maintenance and they help prioritize that kind of tree maintenance and they actually do this almost like mini inventory throughout the summer and then they upload it and they give that to the city forester and he prioritizes his work on tree maintenance with this partnership. It's pretty exciting. A couple of other cities have picked up on this. This was a presentation at, um, at the Alliance for Community Trees Day a couple years ago and people were really excited about it. So they're moving, we've seen this move forward a lot and it doesn't take a lot of knowledge, it takes a lot of training to teach people to do this, and it takes upkeep from the, uh, from, the, from the nonprofit, and so the city pays them a small amount to do that. And it, I think it really works because they have such a strong worker relationship. Canopy is planting trees where the trees are needed and helping to determine the maintenance of those trees. And then also they do go back and do some young tree maintenance as well. 
On the bigger scheme of things, I think this is one of the strongest partnerships that we have in our world, in our urban forestry world, the Sustainable Urban Forest Coalition. The reason I put the picture of the Capitol up there is usually we end up meeting in Washington, D.C. about twice a year. And some people go up on the hill and talk to their senators and, and their Congress, um, their congressional leaders. But mostly it's about sitting at a table with people who could be competitors, people who um, are allied, such as uh, National Recreation and Parks Association, um, the Keep America Beautiful affiliates. We have some people there. American Forest is there. Utility Arborist Association is there. There's lots and lots of people who sit around this table. And this is ultimately a really great partnership. This past year, as we know, we had to fight for funding again. We fight for funding every year at the national level for urban forestry, and we do this as a team. And these people sit at the table representing lots and lots of organizations. And what I think is important here is that you have the opportunity to give feedback always to Sustainable Urban Forestry Coalition and to give them your input. And your representatives for the organizations that you're part of should be able to give you back information about what Sustainable Urban Forestry Coalition is doing. This partnership really helps drive where we're going as a country in urban and community forestry and what we see, where we see the trends are. So for example, I would say that health is a trend right now and how we uh, work with health care providers. And at the last two years at the Sustainable Urban Forest Coalition annual meeting, We've heard about the opportunities to work with the healthcare industry. In California, the Tree, Sacramento Tree Foundation actually works with a, um, um, a health specialist to help drive some of their programming. And this is because we are learning more and more as the research shows us that trees provide healthy communities. And most of that started really with this opportunity to sit around a table with people who have like minds and people who have like goals in making communities better. And that's what Sustainable Urban Forest Coalition is doing right now for urban forestry across the country. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the partnerships that we have developed here, that we have had the opportunity to really share with our partners across the country. So it's hard to see all these little dots, but you can tell that, that there's lots going on across the country at the Arbor Day Foundation. The, dot, the little yellow dots, which are hard to see in there, but those are members of the Alliance for Community Trees. And the Alliance for Community Trees is the program that is an umbrella organization for nonprofits across the country. Our goal is to really help them build their capacity and to pass funding through to them and provide them tools to help make their jobs easier. And I've never, of the members of the Alliance for Community Trees, they really rely on one another to, to build their partnerships and learn what other partnerships are doing. So one of the, um, one of the things I spoke about was the Canopy organization and their, uh, their tree maintenance plans that they give back to the city, well, that's being duplicated across the country because somebody learned it from somebody else and somebody else learned it from somebody else. Um, there's a group in, in um, Florida called Community Greening, and they're brand new, but they have done a, a tremendous amount of work getting their name out in the two and a half years that they've been in existence. And they wanted, there was two gentlemen who started it because they felt that air quality and climate change were two issues that they were dealing with in the communities in which they lived. And they left their day jobs and began to, to do, this, do this project, develop community greening. And they reached across the country to Alliance for Community Treatments members and really, um, really learned a lot from them. The replanting our nation's forest, which is kind of the um, burnt orange colored dot, that's a partnership with the US Forest Service. So we partner with them to actually uh, plant trees in forests throughout the U.S., actually through, throughout the U.S., but we partner with other people throughout the world to plant trees in the nation's forests. And many of you may be affiliated or be close to a Tree Campus USA. We have over 350 campuses, 
in which they're partnering with their municipalities to develop projects and programs so that they can actually um, be named a Tree Campus USA and be part of a network of campuses that are becoming more sustainable through trees. College campuses are one of the places where uh, there's a lot of construction, there's a lot of planning, they grow and they need to change and tree preservation became a part of that as, as more and more alumni and students began to become more aware of what was happening on their campuses with the loss of large trees. So Tree Campus USA communities reach out to one another and actually help each other with answering some of these challenges that they have. And then Community Tree Recovery is another program that I think is really important. And the program where we went and planted in Santa Rosa is really what that was about. So we've been to Bastrop, we've spent a ton of time in Houston this year, we've gone to Florida, all about helping communities recover from natural disasters, whether they're fire and hurricanes or tornadoes or emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle. We're trying to make sure that we're funneling out um, the right kind of funding to those kinds of projects that uh, make communities stronger and better and help them recover. When I was at the project in Santa Rosa, um, I, I grew up near that area. Um, I had not seen it in person. I had only seen pictures and was completely devastated by what I saw. And while I was walking around doing a uh, Facebook Live with our media person here at the Arbor Day Foundation, we were talking to people about what they were doing and we um, stopped and talked to a gentleman who was planting a California buckeye and he said, I asked him, I said, so what are you planting? He said, I'm planting this, you know, California buckeye. He says it's like it's going to be in my backyard because this is where my house used to stand. And it was the most moving thing to me that he was planting in this open space by his, by his own home. And he said these words, he said, this is so healing. I'm going to be able to look out at this tree when my house is built, rebuilt. And he had gotten his permits that day. And we hear stories like that all across the country. We partnered with seven people to make that happen, seven organizations to make that happen. So um, it's important that we continue to do that. And I think it's the responsibility of those of us in urban forestry to explain how trees can help heal. And last, but certainly not least, is Arbor Day's oldest program is the Tree City USA program. We um, will be 50 years old in a few years. And this is, like I said, this is our oldest program. It hit 40 years, two years ago. This is 3,500 communities that believe that um, in the uh, principles of urban forestry really is what this is all about. And we partner with these cities all the time. And we have the opportunity to share the, the Tree City USA story to our corporate partners who are interested in funding, in funding the opportunity to plant trees or care for trees, which goes back to that original list that I showed you, that there are still four things that are very important that, uh, that, that urban foresters need help with and that can, they can use volunteers and partners for. Now, having said all that and talked about um, nonprofit volunteers and other kinds of volunteers that you can work with, um, they're not per things aren't perfect. Um, I will tell you that um, I, when I worked for the Davy Resource Group, I came across some um, interesting inventories that had been done. I had come up that had been done by Boy Scouts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tree planting is not always the way we think it ought to be. I worked with a group in. Um, I won't name the state, but I worked with a group in, in a city and a state and I asked them why they left the cages on um, the trees that they were planting when we were trying to teach the, teach the, uh, um, the volunteers that this was not the best way to plant trees. And they said, well, that was the city's, uh, the city's idea that those cages must stay on. Um, we've worked with communities where trees are planted too deep, where trees are planted uh, too shallow, and yes, there are challenges in working with partners. My suggestions, and this is what I, I tell, um, I tell lots of people this, is that you, you must educate before you start. 
and it's great to have tree plantings. Um, it's great to have people helping you. It's great to have tree care um, opportunities, but you have to have good training materials and you have to have give good opportunity to learn. And you can tolerate, um, you have to know how much you're gonna tolerate in terms of mistakes. And you have to know how much you're going to, um, how much you'll put up with in terms of, um, you know, what people are doing. So I had a tree planting in um, California that I did. We planted a thousand trees in one day. So I couldn't be everywhere. So I had supervisors that were helping me. And one of them was um, from the city of Los Angeles. He was helping me. And I had a couple of other foresters helping me. And I had the former um, head of um, California Department of Fire, Forest and Fire Protection, where urban forestry sits underneath. And we were uh, talking and he was staking a tree and he staked a tree. I've never seen it staked that way before. And I said, is this the way you stake trees? He goes, yes, this is the way you're supposed to stake trees. Well, actually that was the way you used to stake trees when he first started being a forester. And so we had to go back and correct all of the trees. So education is really important no matter who you're working with. I can't emphasize enough that there are best management practices out there for you to obtain. They can be, you know, from the um, from so many so many uh, opportunities to get them from ISA, from um, Arbor Day. Many people use our stuff and put it on their website, and you're welcome to do that. But I think really it's important that you make sure that you have um, all the tools you need to educate those that you're going to partner with. I'll talk a little bit about some. Um, um, non-traditional types of partners that you might want to consider working with. Um, lawyers and attorneys. I'm married to lawyers, so don't make any law a lawyer, so don't make any lawyer jokes. But lawyers and attorneys are always good partners because they always see the risk in everything that you do. Um, you have to decide how much risk you want to absorb, but they are definitely a good partner to have, especially on your tree board or on your nonprofit board. Um, they can um, really help you move things forward or stop you when it gets a little bit dangerous. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to another nonprofit organization or to a municipal organization. They have grant writers that you may not have. If you're looking to write a grant in your small organization or even a city, you can actually uh, reach out to somebody else to help you write your grants. Teachers are fabulous for education, uh, whether they're teaching high school or whether or not they're teaching um, elementary school. They know how to put points across to large groups of people. I would suggest that partnering with educators is something that's really, really important. Whether they're on your board, nonprofit board, or on your tree board, or working with you in some other way, uh, I, I value the input of educators and how, um, how to get trees in the ground. Within a, within a city, um, working with other uh, professionals within a city are, is also can be really important. Larger cities are starting to really pull in sustainability people, and um, depending on you know how that is going um, in your community, um, you might be looking at greenhouse gas reductions, et cetera, et cetera. It is important to involve those sustainability people in your conversations. If you don't have a sustainability person in your city and you have a large employer in your city, most likely they have now a sustainability director. And those kind of people are really good for board service and also um, as volunteers in some form or another. And I wouldn't hesitate to uh, reach out to uh, um, both planning organizations and your local tree, um, tree care organizations. They make great partners. Um, they really like to get involved in their community. I can't think of a tree company that I haven't worked with that hasn't really wanted to be part of what's going on because that's where they live, work, and play. We just had a round of grants come through, and I would say 50% of the grants said we are going to use ABC Tree Company or whoever to actually um, work on helping us make sure that we're doing this correctly.